Hi, everybody. Um, just wanted to let you know I may be on the road this evening driving to Las Vegas for a national conference. And I uh, wanted to make sure that I recorded this just in case I can't get on on time. We're going to be talking about water treatment in today's um, presentation and, and maybe in to Wednesdays as well. But uh, water treatment is a big topic. It is centralized in most dialysis facilities to where all of the dialysis machines are being fed from one source of uh, purified water, which we have a, a water treatment system for that it's usually off the floor in a separate room, um, has several components to its, um, to its make, um, different layers of filters and exchangers and storage tanks and pumps and things like this to, to get the water in shape so that it can be safe for dialysis use. As you may remember, dialysate, one of the uh, components of doing dialysis. So you, you, you have uh, three requirements for dialysis. One is blood, the other is a membrane, and the third is dialysate. So you need to separate blood from dialysate using a membrane. And dialysate is mainly made up of water. The majority of the proportion of dialysate is water. Um, so of a 45x proportioning ratio, the so 45 parts, uh, the water percentage in that is uh, 42, or the, the parts of water, I should say, are 42.28. And then the parts of acid concentrate are one, and uh, the bicarbonate is 1.72. So again, most of the alisate is water. It's purified. Uh, we need to purify it, I should say, because any contaminants that are left in the water will dialyze or diffuse into the patient's blood and then bring their 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 blood levels of whatever contaminant we're we're speaking of. Um, then it will elevate those levels and perhaps cause complication, even death. So so water has the potential to hurt in most dialysis facilities all of the patients at one time if it were left untreated or if it were uh, um, used with uh, inappropriate or, or high levels of contaminants. So again, we have to remove these contaminants through a, a robust water treatment system that, that has multiple layers that we check several times a day, that we check um, on, on different sort of frequencies like monthly and quarterly and annually for, for certain types of contaminants. So, so we'll go over all of that today. Water in itself is a universal solvent. And if you remember, a solvent is a, a, a fluid that will dissolve solids and create solutes. So as a solvent, water is going to pretty much affect everything it touches. And, and when it touches those things, uh, then the, the water will then change because it's going to uh, gain in the elements of whatever it's coming in contact with. So, so for example, like the Grand Canyon, the, the Colorado River is going to be high in the minerals of the earth. Um, or the pipes that run in your house, they're, they're usually made of copper and the copper that comes through your sink is going to have copper in it. Um, but also the, the Grand Canyon is changed by the water, right? Um, it's, it's continuing to have that erosion and, and the chasm in the earth is growing, um, over time, as are your pipes, um, as the water's running from them through them. It's, it's changing the, the makeup of the pipes by the water stealing copper from the pipes. So if, if we think about that universal solvent aspect, when, when water is used in dialysate, it also is going to change the, the blood. Um, it's going to influence the blood, and we call dialysate the bath. Um, but, but whatever's in that bath has the potential to um, increase or decrease levels in the blood. And, and in turn, if, it is, if it's causing like a decrease, then, then the dialysate is going to change as is the case in like um, urea removal or urea in the blood. So your blood has urea in it, dialysate does not. When they're both running through the dialyzer, the urea in the bl blood will diffuse across the membrane into the dialysate. So the, the water has changed. Water usually comes from one of two uh, types of sources. 
It's either surface water or groundwater. So when you pay your water bill, you you pay a company and they get the water from somewhere. They get it from a river, an aqueduct, uh, uh, a lake, a uh, reservoir, a spring, um, uh, under under uh, underground water table or a well. Um, so so surface water is all that stuff that as it kind of insinuates it's up on the surface, the the, the stuff uh, that's that's subject to the elements that's under the sun or under the the, the clouds and the cold and the heat. And, um, you know, sometimes it's flowing in rivers or sitting, uh, not, I wouldn't say stagnant, but not at a, at a high velocity of movement in a lake or sitting just stag, uh, stagnant in a pond or an aqueduct. And, and when you think about all those places um, on the surface water, that if the water was really flowing fast and high velocity versus sitting stagnant, like which one would have more bacterial growth? And the answer is the one that's sitting stagnant because when, when water is sitting still and there's bacteria present, bacteria can cell divide and multiply and colonize uh, much easier when there's no movement from, from preventing it from adhering to surfaces and, like I said, colonizing. Um, whereas in a, like a raging river, there's going to be less bacteria in the, the, the static pond, stagnant pond. Um, when you look at groundwater, like uh, underground tables and wells and springs, um, it's going to have a different characteristic. It's not going to be as high in like living stuff where, where surface water will have a lot of bacteria, fungi, algae. Groundwater will not because when, when the rain hits the earth and then the, the water permeates through the earth, it, it filters uh, the dirt, the, the gravel, the rocks, the clay, all that stuff. It will filter the water of its sediment as well as its um, microbial and organic loads. So the, the groundwater will <clears throat> be lighter and lower in organics, things that living and, and growing and multiplying. Um, but it will be higher in like the elements of the earth. So what, whatever was in the earth that the water permeated through to get to that table or that, that spring, um, the water will be higher in those, those sort of elements. So like high in mineral elements. So again, surface water is the, the, from the river, lakes, uh, ponds, streams, even the ocean, but we don't typically use ocean water for a, a source of fresh water, right? Um, and then the groundwater in the wells and springs, um, they have different type of uh, uh, traditional uh, contaminants. So, like a poor illustration, but gets the picture across. This is called the hydrologic cycle, and uh, you know there's a constant cycling of purification of water on Earth. Uh, the 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 water that is surface water under the heat. And under the sun will evaporate. And when it evaporates, it's purified, it's liberated of all its contaminants. But, but you know, what's in our air, what's in our atmosphere, um, what's in our clouds even? There are dust and gas and other impurities. And I remember years ago, we used to talk a lot about acid rain. Um, but yeah, there are impurities in the air. So once it's evaporated, it, it, it picks up stuff inside of uh, the air. And, and then you have that uh condensation and precipitation forming of clouds and and you know once the water is uh, uh precipitated enough it will uh fall in the form of rain and when the rain falls it falls in rivers and lakes and, and ponds but it also falls on the earth and and hits the plants and the trees and, and all of that right so depending on where it falls it it, it will um I guess, you know, become kind of compartmentalized to, to that area. So if it, if it falls on the lake or the rivers, then it's going to be surface water. If it falls on the ground, um, you know, it may be absorbed and, and through osmosis into the plants and trees, um, or it may seep through the, the ground and uh, work its way through all the, the, the elements of the earth, pick up mineral impurities and end up in a well or a spring. <clears throat> but but this cycle continues to go on. I mean, the water on Earth doesn't disappear; it just changes form. Uh, form. 
uh, more people on earth, more water, more water in people, right? More plants on earth, more water in, in plants. Um, but, but as far as these areas or these, <clears throat> uh, sources of water, um, the hydrologic cycle keeps water moving on earth, uh, at all times. And again, it, it, it doesn't disappear. Uh, we have droughts in areas, um, like, you know, especially sometimes here in California where there's water rationing and things like this for agriculture. Um, it, it affects agriculture. Um, but there, there is not a shortage of water on earth. It's, it's just the, the source of the water. I mean, if we were to tap into our ocean as a source of water by just doing dialysis on the ocean water, to tell you the truth, we could turn it into fresh water and, and have a source of fresh water. And there are countries around the world that do that. Uh, United States being way behind on that. <clears throat> um, the exposure of water. So when you think about what you drink uh, per day, and it may not be water. We, I think we talked about this the other day. A lot of people might have nothing but Coke or Pepsi throughout the day. But on, on average, there's a, a one to two liters taken in per day and, and about 14 liters of water per week um, from, from the average consumption. <clears throat> and re remember that the average consumption, we'll, we'll call it the average person who doesn't have kidney failure can excrete toxins because their kidneys are functioning can take out the garbage, right? <clears throat> so they can excrete their urine toxins in their blood as long as their kidneys are functioning. Um, but when you drink, the, the first place it hits is your gut, your GI tract, right? And uh, a lot of the contaminants that, that are in water or even in food would be picked up in our GI tract. And sometimes we get sick from those things. Like we might get diarrhea or, or um, vomiting or something like this because that's our gut's defense mechanism of purging those, those uh those contaminants. So, so average person, 14 liters per week, can excrete toxins and has the GI tract to protect the body against some of these contaminants before it actually gets to the blood. Hemodialysis patient still drinks, shouldn't drink as much, maybe only about a liter per day, so half of what the average consumption is, but their exposure to water through dialysate is upwards of 360 liters per week. And, and that math will come from, if you guys just um, do this calculation, okay, on your own time. <clears throat> if we run the dialysate for four hours at 500 milliliters per minute, so four hours, 500 milliliters per minute, that means that we're doing 240 minutes times 500. And what we end up with is 120,000 milliliters or 120 liters. That's one treatment. Patients come three treatments a week, so there's the 360, right? 120 times three, 360. That's at a 500 milliliter dialysate flow rate. The dialysate flow rate could be higher. So again, uh, upwards of 360 liters per week exposure through dialysate in a dialyzer. Our patients' kidneys don't work, so they can't excrete toxins. And unlike the drinking uh, scenario, Dialysate and the water in dialysate is exposed directly to the blood via the dialyzer membrane. So um, there is a, a, a different route of exposure. There's no gut in place to uh, absorb or prevent the um, prevent the contaminants from getting to the blood. So so that high volume, that failure or that that inability to excrete toxins, and then that direct exposure of the contaminant to the blood make dialysate purity or water purity for dialysate um, critical. Like we have standards that we have to meet and it's not just safe drinking water standards. It's the standards that are set from the group AMI, A-A-M-I, the Association for the Advancement of Medical Instrumentation. <clears throat> so I want to back up one uh, slide. When, when we look at this scenario here, if, if water was going to get to your house, you know, let's call this little house here. That's your house. You got to get the water from a city, like a municipality or, or a water company, right? And they get it from somewhere. And then before they give it to you, they have to make it safe for drinking. So the, the drinking water standards are different from the, um, the Amy standards or, or the standards that are held for uh, water and dialysis. The, the safe drinking water standards are a long list of contaminants that 
have to meet the standards established by the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency. There's a shorter list from Amy that, that is inclusive in the safe drinking water standards, but it enhances the requirements. So the EPA list is long for safe drinking water standards. The Amy list is shorter, but it's it's more strict on the things that it's it's referring to. Okay. <clears throat> so a couple things to think about. Um, what can we do to ensure the safety of feed water that will be used for dialysis? So in other words, the water that's coming to us, how can we make sure it's safe? And if you're getting your water in your house from a, a company, they supply you with like annual reports on the water and you can communicate with them. Well, we get the water from the same place and we get those annual reports. We look at them very carefully. We communicate with the water companies. Um, we have like a kind of a first name basis with them because our water is a little bit different than the water to like, let's say a house or a business. This water is used for life sustaining treatment. And if there's a problem with water, we need to be the first to know. Um, so, so again, we pay attention to logs. We stay in tight communication. If the city's going to do something different or the water companies can do something different to the water, we ask that we're the first to know, or, or we try and stay in that like, uh, tight communication to where before they put chemicals in the water or before they make changes to the pipes in the city or shut down the water or anything that they would let us know so that we could um, make arrangements in advance for the patients to get dialysis somewhere else. And then we, we also test that water. So we, we uh, aside from just trusting what they tell us in their reports, we test it and we, we test the, the raw or the feed water and then we treat it and then we test it again to check, you know, what we've done to it. We, we check the product water, what, what we've done after we've ran it through all of our water system. And, and then we'll be talking about this, but like, how would we know that there's a water treatment problem? And I, I think we just spoke on that as far as testing, but there are occasions where we don't have any abnormal test results, um, but we have abnormal patient outcomes. Maybe their blood is, you know, a lot of patients are starting to have, let's say, something like high aluminum. If it's, if it's a shared condition or blood level among many patients, we will always look at water to see if that's a potential cause because water in a clinical setting, all the patients are sharing the same water. So it, it makes sense that if they all have the same problem, like what else do they all have the same of? Do they have the same tech? Do they have the same machine? Do they have the same water? And, and water we know is, is shared. We have like one water treatment system that supplies the same product water to all the machines in the facility, which may be, you know, 10, 12, 20, 24, and upwards um, as far as the number of patients or number of machines running at one time. So we break down the water treatment into categories. We have uh, a feed water category, a pre-treatment category, and a primary treatment category. And, and I'll, I'll keep it simple on this slide so that we can dive into each of those devices in, in those categories, but feed water is just um, dealing with the characteristics of the water um, to get it into our facility and, and run it through our system. So we, we, we do a few things to it, like make sure that it, it can't go back into the safe drinking supply. Um, we will adjust the temperature because temperature is going to be a, a factor to um, like the amount of product water that we produce. Um, so it's, it's part of the efficiency. Um, and then we have pumps just to increase the pressure and get it flowing fast enough to where it can get to our systems. On the pretreatment side, we will do things like get the water ready for its actual treatment. And, and it's like just making the water, uh, changing the characteristics of the water so that the, the, the primary treatment mechanisms can do their job and only their job, not have to do anything else. So we do things like change the pH in the water. So through chemical injection, uh, we remove all the big stuff from it with just like cheap filters called sediment filters. Uh, we remove hard minerals like calcium and magnesium so that uh, the hard minerals won't plaque up the pipes uh, in our system or 
uh, the membranes like that we use for primary treatment called reverse osmosis membranes. Uh, and then we have carbon tanks, which will remove chemicals from the water that the city adds or the water company adds um, to prevent microbial growth like chlorine and ammonia or chloramine. Okay, so these are disinfectants for the water that can really hurt your patient. So that's the pretreatment. And then the primary treatment is the, the, um, the reverse osmosis membrane. There is a deionization option as well, but primary water treatments with reverse osmosis and deionization is usually used as a backup. Reverse osmosis is a mechanical method of filtering water under high pressure um, and taking it from an uh, area of high concentration to lower concentration through uh, high pressure, forcing the water across a, a very small submicron filter. Uh, it's a very complete, thorough source of water treatment that will remove sediment, but also um, chemical, um, all the way down to a virus. A very, very effective treatment. Okay, and then we have another one called deionization, which, like I said, will be more of a backup. And I'll, and I'll explain why as we describe that device. So don't worry about the schematic here. Just a backflow preventer, I, I think it's pretty self-explanatory. It prevents the water from backing up. Once it comes into our city, or sorry, into our uh, system, which it's coming from the city, right? And the safe drinking water supply, once it comes to us, we don't want it to go back to the safe drinking supply because can the, can the city or the municipality, can they ensure that it's safe if everybody can just put water back into it? No, right? So a backflow prevention device is there to, once the water comes into your device or into your system, that it cannot go back into the safe drinking supply. And, and the way that it, it protects the safe drinking supply that is, if there was a condition like a pressure change in the system or something that would make it to where the water would go backwards, this device will not allow that, will take it down a relief valve and down the drain. So the water, if it was atmospherically driven to move back into the safe drinking supply or, or move backwards, it wouldn't go into the drinking supply. It would go down the drain into the sewage. So this is a protective device. It's a piece of plumbing. It's inspected every year by a plumber um, and tagged. Um, so it's not water treatment. It's just a protective uh, a public safety mechanism. But then we have water, uh, uh, a tempering valve or a blending valve that is going to basically make your shower, you know, the, the temperature that you like it. But it's not for your shower, of course. It's for uh, the ideal temperature for water treatment. And the ideal temperature for water treatment is somewhere around 77 Fahrenheit. That's the ideal uh, membrane operate, operating temperature. With that temperature, um, if you remember, temperature affects like molecule movement and diffusion and all that kind of stuff. Well, at, at 77, that's the ideal temperature for um like maximizing your, your product of water. So if we're treating water and we want to get, like we're putting one gallon in per minute, we would like to get one gallon out per minute of product water. That is impacted by um, the temperature. So the, the temperature being lower than 77 might not have the, um, the product rate or the product uh, uh, volume that we're looking for. We get the most product, we get the most bang for our buck at 77 Fahrenheit. <clears throat> so if you're mixing hot and cold water, uh, you, you have to make the hot water, right? So you need a, um, a water heater. So every clinic will have some sort of probably a tankless water heater. Then we have booster pumps. And, and this is a simple concept just to increase the pressure of water. Um, in the system or in the pipes so that the, the water will move at the right velocity. We need it to move fast. And then we also need it to make it through those, through all those tanks and stuff. So that requires a lot of pressure and booster, booster pumps will be um, the, the device we use to increase that pressure or build up and then increase pressure throughout our system. They, they may be located in, in a couple of different places in the water room. <clears throat> And we have, uh, in some cases, not all, uh, 
chemical injection or chemical feed pumps. And, and a chemical feed pump is basically where you'd have like a, a solution that is either acid or base or alkaline. And, <clears throat> excuse me, um, what you would be doing is, it's, it's kind of like a medication pump. It, it's not something you have to do, it's automated by the way. But this, this pump, what it will do <clears throat> is take from that solution tank and slowly infuse, let's say like acid into the water. Why acid or, or why alkaline? Uh, it's called pH or uh, pH up or down. So what we're trying to do is increase or lower the pH based off of the feed water pH. So like, what is the pH of the water coming from the city? If it's too high or too low, what we'll do is we will put in a slowly infused chemical to adjust that pH and make it at the ideal pH for water treatment. <clears throat> Just like temperature, the, the efficiency of the water treatment um, can be affected by pH. So, so adjustments may be required. And, and I would say like in agricultural or desert cities, stuff like this, you'll see these sort of tanks, but I, I, I haven't typically seen them in like metro areas. And then there's a lot of names for this filter right here, or a lot of types of this filter, um, but I'll, I'll, I'll try to keep it simple. That This filter is there to pick up stuff that you can see in the water. Stuff like sand and gravel and rocks and stick and anthracite, like stuff that if you shook up your glass of water, you'd see floating around, this is probably going to pick it up. A multimedia filter is where there are different sizes of media inside of the tank. So as the water works through it, it'll capture like big stuff on top, then the next size down, the next size. So it, it, it captures or retains based off like size selectivity. So layers of various gravel. A size gravel, sand, anthracite uh, will 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 um, filter specific to the density of the contaminants. And and what we can do is, if it gets plugged up, we can just reverse the flow and wash it out. We call it backwash. It requires high pressure to do that, um, and that absolutely should be done only when the patients aren't running treatment, like when the the facility is not operational. Okay. And then this is a, a, a kind of an important tank um, from a, a knowledge base. You'll probably be asked quite a few questions on your certification exams about water softener. Water softener is there to do an ion exchange, ion exchange. So it exchanges water hardness, calcium and magnesium for sodium. So the, the, the calcium and magnesium are hard minerals, sodium is a soft mineral. And what we have, th this is just an example of the two processes that we have, right? There's two tanks. One is a water softener. One is a brine tank that holds a bunch of salt in it and, and a, uh, water as well that will be below the, the layer of the salt. Like these are like salt rocks, okay? Like pellets of salt. This will be filled up with salt and it will have water in it, but the water should be below the salt level. So in other words, you have more salt than water. And, and why? Because we're trying to super saturate that, that water, make it to where it cannot even dissolve any more sodium. So it's super salty brine solution, brine solution. They call it a brine tank. Okay? And what we'll do first is we'll rinse out this whole water softener with uh, purified water, make it clean. Okay? Then we'll take the water that's in that brine tank and we'll flush it to recharge this water softener and load it up with uh, sodium. Okay, so it's going to have a bunch of sodium in it now. And you see all these little brown dots in the tank. That's going to be like this big blue bubble, okay, full of sodium. And then when the water comes in to that tank and brings like uh, calcium, then the sodium starts to fall off of those little brown things in the tank. They're, they're called resin beads. Sodium starts to fall off, and eventually you have all, all, all hard minerals on this in this water softener. Once it's plugged up with hard minerals, then we go back, we backwash it, make it clean again, and fill it up with salt again. So it's regenerated. This can be done in house. You don't have to send it off site to get it done. We 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 regenerate it, make it new as often as we need to. 
And again, that regeneration should happen in non-operational hours when patients aren't on the machine. Then we have uh, uh, another tank, the carbon tank, the carbon tanks, I should say, that are there for patient safety to remove uh, the disinfectants that are added from the, the water companies. Um, typically, in in municipalities or water companies, um, they will uh, put chlorine in the water, just like in pools, right, to prevent microbial growth, as well as ammonia, which makes it a more long-lasting, stable disinfectant. And when you take chlorine and ammonia, it forms something called chloramine. And chloramine, if we were to not take it out of the water, would harm our filters, like the RO membranes, reverse osmosis membranes. And if it made it past the filters and got to the patient, it can kill them, All right? It's, it's bleach. So if that were to get to the patient's uh, blood, it would cause real damage to their blood called hemolysis, rupture of red blood cells. And, and there could be serious consequence to hemolysis like cardiac arrhythmia and cardiac arrest. So we have two tanks in our, our clinic, at least two tanks, to make sure we clean up and get rid of all the chlorine and chloramine. We have a primary tank and a worker tank, or sorry, a polisher tank. A, a primary and a secondary or a worker and a polisher, okay? And what has to happen is the first tank has to get the whole job done. We gotta bring the chlorine down to the levels that are acceptable which is less than 0.1 part per million, okay? Less than 0.1 part per million. The second one is there just as a redundant safeguard. It is not supposed to be really doing anything um, outside of polishing. All the work should be done in the first one. And we'll test right here every day before every patient shift with a maximum of four hours, right at the first sampling port. If the result is 0.1 or higher, then we'll check after the second tank. And that should be good because it's a backup. Either way, when we have high results, we're going to report to the nurse and then we're going to take the actions or, or follow the protocols of the clinic. So we'll get back to this in a few minutes. Two tanks, they have to be in a series and they actually have like some spec requirements, like the water has to take at least 10 minutes from the time it goes in the first one to the time it exits the second one, has to take at least 10 minutes. That's called an empty bed contact time, empty bed contact time, okay? So two tanks in a series to remove chlorine and chloramines, they're carbon tanks, right? They have to have an empty bed contact time of at least 10 minutes. And this is what's inside of them. There's this granular activated charcoal or carbon um, it's a burned organic material, it's extremely porous. It's got like a lot of parking spaces for chlorine and chloramine. And, and the surface area is, is almost uh, unimaginable. Like you, you, a, a teaspoon of GAC can uh, have the surface area of a football field. That, that's really hard to visualize. Um, but basically every one of those little specks, those little grain, granules, they have holes all around them. So if you were to lay all those holes from one teaspoon of it out together, it'd have the surface area of a football field. It's, again, really hard to imagine, but it just speaks to the, the capacity. And, and then um, there are some specs on the type of carbon we use and the micron size and the iodine ratings, which is not too important to you guys. Um, and, and then also we, we, when we first get these tanks, we typically do like an acid wash to remove any sort of manufacturing debris, which you can imagine there's a lot of. If, if the water just ran through that GAC, we want to clean it up just in case it has any of those granules or manufacturing debris. So we have a pre-filter in place. It's just a cheap filter, to, like a final barrier um, before we actually treat the water. Final barrier for anything that's easy to get out. Okay. And, and why do I say that? Why is all this stuff necessary if we have a reverse osmosis membrane? The reverse osmosis membrane has a very small submicron pore. It can remove tiny things. So we don't want to waste that capacity on big things that a cheap little filter can pull out. So that's why we have a lot of these tanks before. A lot of this stuff that we're talking about is just making it so the RO can do its job better. 
So then we have the the RO membranes and and important concept. The the water has to be boosted. It has to have that that those booster pumps, right? To increase the pressure um and and then be forced across really multiple layers of uh, of membrane. It's like a jelly roll of of membrane. So they're like laid layer after layer after layer on top of each other. And the water is forced from the outside of this tube shaped filter to the inside of it, where it has a perforated tube and the product water can then be carried to the machine. If it does not make it through the layers of membrane, so like this, it will be concentrate and will need to be cleaned again. So what we're looking for is this permeate, this blue water, right? the product water. And, and again, things like temperature will affect how much water actually makes it to permeate. That ideal temperature makes it to more water, to where more water will get through the membrane to that, to that product or to that, that perforated central tube to become product water. It's, it's, you know, under a microscope, it's similar, um, material as our dialyzers, like a thin film composite, some sort of plastic. So why would it be so important to, to protect this membrane? Well, it's the primary treatment. It can remove small stuff, right? It can, um, it's, it's like the final barrier before the patient as well. So it's important to protect this membrane, one, because it's, it's our method of treating water. We don't want to have failure on the ability to treat water and remove contaminants, right? Also, it's very expensive. So, um, you know, there's a, an economic factor to protection and, and keeping, like prolonging the, the longevity of the RO membrane. <clears throat> and then this, this device here, like, um, I just get like negative when I talk about deionization tanks because I don't like them. They, um, they are not a thorough method of water treatment. They can only remove positive and negative charged ions. They cannot remove sediment, like things that are floating around, or bacteria or any sort of uh, microbial contaminant. So they're not thorough. They should only be used as a backup or a polisher, um, but should not be a long-term plan for, for water treatment. The way they work is they have um, similar to a water softener, they do ion exchange, but with different, uh, a different focus. It's not trying to remove just calcium and magnesium in this case. It's trying to remove anything that has a positive or a negative charge. And the way that it does that is first the system will be coated or the, the tank, the deionization tank will be coated with hydrogen and hydroxyl ions. So positive cations, negative anions. And then when the water comes into that tank and it has a positive ion, it will grab the positive ion, like let's say sodium, and let go of the positive ion hydrogen. And then a negative comes in and let's say it's chloride, it will grab that and let go of hydroxyl. When you have hydrogen and hydroxyl combined, you have H2O. So it's a very pure chemical form of water, but again, it cannot remove uh, microbial, or, or uh, sediment contaminants. Most water systems will also have a ultraviolet irradiator or a UV light. The UV light is basically a sleeve that water will pass through while being, um, while, while having uh, UV light irradiated on it. So it's a mercury vapor lamp enclosed in a quartz uh, a fused cord sleeve, so that that sleeve water will go in and out of it. When it goes in there, it's it's got the light shi um, shining on it or radiating on it, and it will kill things like bacteria or virus. Um, but it will still leave the remnants, like the body parts, the the, the cell membranes of those uh, organisms that that would need to be cleaned up afterwards. Okay, and to clean it up, we just have another cheap filter in place, uh, a submicron filter. Okay. Um, they, they call them submicron, ultra filter, or pyrogen filters. And you'll probably have this type of filter located in several layers of the facility, maybe in the water system, maybe on the distribution loop, like where the, the, the water is flowing through the pipes to the walls, um, and then maybe even on the machines themselves. Uh, 
All right, so that's the that's the components of the water treatment system. Um, we will talk in a few minutes about how to check those things, you know, what sort of checks we do on a daily basis. But but something that is of real concern to every water treatment system and every dialysis facility is the potential of bacterial uh, presence and growth. Um, we need to do things to control and, and prevent microbial growth. So we, we have to do a disinfection, right? And we're going to do disinfection at least once a month. That's, that's key, all right? At least once a month, we do disinfection of our water system, our distribution loop. Um, um, well, that, 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 that would be, that, that would be that, that at least monthly, uh, water system and distribution loop. And the way we can do that is with different sort of chemicals, disinfecting chemicals or, uh, gas like ozone or even just, uh, the, the application of heat using hot water. So, so we'll talk about some of those and, um, you'll, you'll probably be questioned on this, like how often, at least monthly, um, what sort of disinfectant, um, bleach could be one of the chemicals, parasitic acid could be another, um, there's even something called citric acid, uh, and then like I said, ozone, which is a gas, it's called O3, or, or systems that can use, um, or can heat the water and allow it to dwell and circulate for a, a period of time. We also do at least monthly microbial monitoring. And um, this picture here is not, we haven't talked about this yet, but this picture here is um, the distribution loop. So once the water is treated through the reverse osmosis membrane, a lot of clinics will store it. And then when, as it's needed, they'll take from that storage tank and distribute it out to the treatment floor where all of these little red valves are machined. But if you store it, like that storage tank is a great place for bacteria to grow. So, so if you store it, most likely you'll have stuff after the storage tank, like the UV light that I talked about, the, the ultraviolet radiation, and then some filters to clean it up, clean up like the dead bodies of the bacteria, right? Um, so, so storage tanks, okay? Let, let, let's talk about this really quick. If you have a storage tank, the, the increased risk for bacterial growth um, leads to a, a higher requirement for flow velocity in our systems. To prevent microbial growth in water treatment systems, we have to move the water um, with a storage tank. It has to be at least three feet per second. So the water has to be moving through those pipes at least three feet per second. If there is no storage tank, it has to be at least 1.5 feet per second. So the storage tank enhances the requirements, right? Like you need to move the water faster because the storage tank has a higher risk for microbial growth. All right, so let's go one by one through each of these uh, devices. And um, when we meet on Wednesday, um, we, will, we'll, we will go over a, a water log. Um, I'll take you through a water log on how, you, how, how the staff would actually check these devices, all right? So on a daily basis, somebody goes into the, into the, uh, the water room when the, when the clinic opens, and they turn on the water and they wait at least 15 minutes and then they start to do all the checks on the water. And the checks on the water, they'll have like a, a, a water log, like a, a checklist basically that they got to go through. It's on page, there's an example on page 289 of your book, um, table six, water monitoring log example. And, and we'll just run through that list and fill in all the blanks. Um, by checking different parameters on the water system. So um, every day when we come in, we'll look at the temperature blending valve. That's the one that's supposed to make the right temperature yeah. and make sure it's at the right temperature and that it's not fluctuating. And if it's not at the right temperature, that's not your job to change it. It's just your job to document it and do the proper reporting. Okay, so you're logging. On the, we, we also have that backflow prevention device and the thing that we're going to be um, checking for there is like the drops across the device to make sure that um, it's not um, greater than 10 pounds per square inch from the baseline. So like if, if the gauge 
right here is um you know 50 psi and this is um you know 20 psi um that would be something that is you know we we document regardless but that would be something that needs to be looked into and then also with this backflow prevention device the water is supposed to be moving you know in the direction but if it was going to move the other direction this device would prevent it from going back to the city but would take it down the drain so if i looked at this device and i saw water going down the drain i would also need to document and report that 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 multimedia filter that i talked about we're going to check that every day too and we need to basically we're looking at pressure on all of these tanks there's always going to be higher pressure on the feed to a tank than there is on the relief of the tank. So if this is 20, it's gonna drop because there's resistance in this pressure on the other side. So it might be 20, might be 18 over here. Anything greater than 10 is something that we, we would look into. And this one we, we look at quite a bit. We checked this, this tank, if you look on that log, that, that uh, water treatment log, um, we check it twice a day, in the beginning and the ending of the day. We look at the post softener hardness. So we take a sample of water right here, and then we'll test it with some sort of testing device or strip to make sure that it has less than one grain per gallon or 17 parts per million in the water hardness. One grain per gallon or 17 parts per million. Begin the day, end another day. We will also check this brine tank and make sure it has enough salt that it's above the salt water. If not, we'll fill it up. Um, and then we also want to check this tank like to see if the, the salt is still in a tablet form or if it became just like one big rock, like a, they call it a salt bridge. If it became just one big rock, then we're gonna have to like break it up and take it out and start over again, which doesn't happen too often. Um, and then as with every tank, we look at pressure before, pressure after and observe and document the pressure drops. Any, any device that has a regeneration timer, you, you remember I said that certain devices they would like backwash or regenerate that should happen when the patients are not on the machine and that'll happen with the timer and when we check the system in the morning we'll make sure that the timer is in sync with the time that the timer settings are appropriate again don't change them if they're wrong you, unless you're responsible for that you just do the documentation the reporting Then the carbon tanks, like I said, two tanks in a series, um, they have to have that empty bed contact time that we talked about. We check before each patient shift with a maximum of four hours in between the check, okay? Every shift, maximum of, before every shift with a maximum of four hours. <clears throat> the, the, what are we looking for? We're looking for, and don't get confused by this, okay? That first bullet point says chlorine levels within Amy standards of 0.5 okay but if it is uh so when i say chlorine levels that's free chlorine if it is chloramine that they're asking about is less than 0.1 but there's also another measurement called total chlorine and that is also less than 0.1 okay so what are we looking for less than 0.5 ppm of free chlorine less than 0.1 uh, PPM of total or uh, chlorine or chloramine. We're also going to observe just like every other tank, the pressure drops and document those. Anything 10 or greater is something to look at. And then we're going to check to make sure that the timers are in sync with um, the settings and that there's not going to be any back flushing or regeneration of this tank when the facility is not in, uh, sorry, when the facility is in operation. It has to happen when the patients are not on the machine all of these regenerations to protect the patients from any sort of hazard um, to, to, you know, it's for patient safety. So test for free chlorine, test for total chlorine. The difference is chloramine. We don't do that anymore. We used to have to do two tests just to get one result. And what I think the consensus in the industry was that, that people just weren't doing it right. So we started to do only one test, and that was the total chlorine test, which we hold to the less than 0.1 part per million. Uh, chloramine, there is not actually a direct test to do it. You would have to do the test both and subtract method to get that. So we just hold the level at less than 0.1 for total chlorine. 
Okay. You can also say that that's the same acceptable level for chloramine, less than 0.1 part per million. We don't do any tests on the system until we've run the water for at least 15 minutes. And um, as far as the chlorine test goes or the chloramine test, we make sure that we test between the primary and the secondary tank or the worker and the polisher first. And if the results are too high, then we go to the secondary, which is a redundant tank and, and there as a polisher and everything should be good. So what do you do if the chloramines are too high after the second tank or even the first tank? So let's say the first tank is high, second tank is good. Like every time you test the water, you have to share that result with the nurse and the, the charge nurse and they'll sign off on it. So if the first tank was no good, but the second was, was okay, we would make a biomedical call to a vendor. They would come out and take out that first tank, take it off site, take our second tank, put it in the primary place and put a brand new second tank as the redundant polisher. So second tank is always in good shape, right? It's, it, the redundancy is to make sure that if we have a problem, there's something that's going to, uh, you know, have coverage for the patient safety. So you'll be using different type of strips um, that probably require color sensitivity. Like you got to be able to see those different shades. Uh, free chlorine levels less than 0.5 part per million. Chloramine or total chlorine levels less than 0.1 part per million. Make sure that you get clarity training. You're, you feel comfortable and competent on the test that you do. You'll get a color blindness test. If you're colorblind, you will not do this test. Somebody else will have to do it. Um, but there are a million different strips and a million different type of tests out there. And in the future, it's already here, but I, it's not very, not very utilized. Um, there are systems that can do the check for us. Like we wouldn't have to take out strips or take out a separate device. There are systems that can give us live display of what our chlorine levels are. And then uh, our reverse osmosis. Um, a reverse osmosis system. Um, so this, this guy is simple but complex. I, I explained that it's just a filter, right? It's just layers of membrane. But when you look at this picture, that looks more like more than, it, it's an illustration, looks like more than just a filter. But it, it does. It has a control panel, it has a user interface, and it has um, multiple other filters built into that entire unit just to get that reverse osmosis job done. It, it has sensors and displays um, and alarms that can tell us different things about the performance of the system and the safety of the water. So things like um, water pressures, um, temperatures, um, electro conductivity before and after. So conductivity of the uh, water before and after. Conductivity is gonna uh, be relative to like contaminant levels. Something called TDS, total dissolved solid. Some systems can check pH. They can check the product water and the rejection rate. So, so this is not just a mechanical device, but it's also an analyzer. Um, a, a, a device that can give you a lot of data. It has a, a monitor um, that is built into the system that will, from the water room, send a message to the, the treatment floor um, as certain processes are happening or if certain conditions arise like unsafe water or un, un, unsafe conditions, it can alarm us on the treatment floor and tell us something's wrong. Um, in some cases, even bypass the water from um, getting to the patient. So some of the monitoring that we do in regard to the reverse osmosis um, machine or membrane is that we do an annual, at least an annual chemical analysis on all the water pre-treatment pre and post-treatment. So feed or raw and product water, we, we do... Uh, a water analysis or a chemical analysis. So we, we take samples, we send it to the lab, and we get the results on everything. You know, what potassium, calcium, sodium, all that kind of stuff, right? So at least annually, but it is recommended that you do it more frequently, like quarterly, um, just not mandated. Um, we have several methods of continuous monitoring by direct and indirected 
uh, indirect um, monitoring mechanism. So we can do like um, the daily test, but then we also can look at our patients, right? We can look at their blood work and their symptoms, and, and that is going to give us uh, clue us in as to the quality of the water as well. So for the deionization tanks, I hope you guys don't have to work with these to tell you the truth. They're, they're associated with patient injury and a lot of human error. Um, we, we basically, this tank is going to remove all the charged, charged, uh, uh, charged ions from the water. So, uh, chemicals would be completely eradicated if the DI is functioning properly. Um, there are different sort of, uh, compensations like temperature compensation. Um, there are audible and visual alarms on our last tanks. There are light indicators, and it can be pretty confusing to tell you the truth. It's it's not like a, a a complex user interface, but they're different tank to tank, or I should say, manufacturer to manufacturer. Ultimately, what we're looking for is to have less than one meg ohm resistivity um, in the water, and that that says that we are you know chemically pure. Like DI water, you could stand in and not. And electricity wouldn't be able to pass through you, like in a bath or something like that. You can't conduct charge. Um, whereas like RO water, even though it's a much better method of water treatment, it, it still has a lot of chemical left in it at the end. You would get, you, you, a, a current would pass through RO water, whereas DI water, it won't. So, so let's, let's look at those timers. If you remember, some of the tanks have timers on of them. Some of the, the components have timers on them to uh, automate processing. And it's always possible that the power could go out or something could get unplugged in a, in a maintenance procedure or something like that. And, you know, the timer gets offset. And if you remember, we want this to happen in non-operational hours because if it happens when the patients are on the machine, there's a potential for complication just related to pressures, pressure requirements, but also there's a potential for exposure to that stuff that we're like backwashing or that we're um, regenerating the tank from. So like if we're backwashing a sediment filter that's all plugged up with contaminants, there's a possibility that those contaminants could make it to the patient if the patient was running at the same time. So so the 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 timers are set after hours to protect patients and, and in the interest of patient safety. And then the, the same for the second question, like if the water doesn't meet the, the AMI standards, we shouldn't use it. Why? Because the AMI standards are set based off of thresholds for patient injury. So we know that if it's higher than the AMI standards in contaminants, that our patients are going to get hurt. If, so if we know our water is higher than Amy standards, we shouldn't be using it. It should go to the drain. There, there are valve systems that we can deliver all the water to the drain and protect our patients at once. And really important that you understand the microbial um, standards in, uh, in uh, water. Okay, so the maximum allowable um, bacteria level called colony forming unit in water use for hemodialysis is 200 colony forming unit per milliliter. But we have to actually take an action at uh, anything that is 50 or higher. So, so we really, uh, our acceptable is like um, one to 49 or, or zero to 49. 50, to 199 is action and 200 that's like we're, we're not supposed to be doing dialysis at that level or, or i should say uh i'm sorry 50 to 200 is uh acceptable 201 is where we we would need to we couldn't use that water for dialysis okay so under our clinics protocol it would be you know to to not do dialysis find like go into an emergency situation and find somewhere else where the patients can dialyze today and tomorrow or whatever time it takes us to fix this problem. So bacteria, 200 maximum, 50 action level, okay? 
the endotoxin levels, which is endotoxins are like the cell membrane, the, 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 the byproduct, even the poop of bacteria. The maximum level is two endotoxin unit per milliliter and an action level of one endotoxin unit per milliliter. So both of those levels are checked at least monthly, at least monthly, okay, in the water. And we do it by taking samples of the water and performing two different types of tests. One is a culture where they, they take the sample of the water, they put it in a Petri dish in an incubated, uh, or I should say a temperature controlled environment for a certain period of time and see what grows. That's cultures. That's for bacteria, okay? Um, endotoxin units, it's, it's not a live bacteria, so it's a simple count. And they do it with something called an LAL, Limalis amoebocyte lysate test. <clears throat> um, this one is basically, it's a fast turnaround where they, they put it on their, on a paddle where it's got this LAL on it, Limalis amoebocyte lysate, which is the blood of a horseshoe crab. And based off of the, the interaction between the sample and that, that, that media, um, they are able to count the endotoxin units. So basically an endotoxin coming in contact with the blood of a horseshoe crab will cause coagulation. So it will show clot. And then just to reiterate, we do the, the, a, a lot of sample collection. Every month, we, at least, we have to um, check our bacteria levels in our water system. And we don't just take one sample. We take multiple from different areas of the water system, different tanks, um, uh, like the RO, the holding tank, um, any water that's returning at the end of a loop, like, like it, it, it went through the, the clinic and wasn't used and then comes back to a storage tank, that would be checked. If we have reprocessing equipment, for sure, um, water entering and leaving, and same with any concentrate mixing, like if we're mixing bicarbonate or acid concentrates. So take a lot of samples, send them off every month, and everything has to be um, within range less than 200 colony forming units, less than 50 on the action level, right? And then uh, less than two endotoxin units or one on the action level. What does action level mean? Action level means if you're at that or higher, you have to create a plan of correction. It has to go into QAPI, the Quality Assessment uh, Performance Improvement Plan. And you have to fix it. And you have to show documentation that you had the problem, you created a plan, you fixed the problem. Medicare can, can request all of that, or, or the Department of Public Health can request all of that documentation when they come in for their surveys. The testing mechanisms or methods for bacteria um, levels, like colony forming units and, and endotoxin units, we don't do that in-house, okay? We send the, the, the samples off, so we're working with a um, uh, lab specimen, or sorry, a lab company, and we send it off, and all of their procedures are very um, uh, structured. So um, has to be assayed within uh, one to two hours of drawing or refrigerate at five Celsius for 24 hours, which that's what we do, because we're not going to get it done in two hours, right? Um, there's got to be certain membrane fil uh, filter techniques. Um, like the way that they actually get it onto the plate, um, very specific. The type of media or the growth media that they use, very specific as well. It's kind of changed over the years. And, and I'm not like going into detail because this is not important for you guys, but um, TSA, tryptic, uh, uh, trip, trypsicase, soy agar um, or equivalent, Whereas we used to use like blood or chocolate agars and the media, okay? Uh, the, the incubation temperature, uh, 35 to 37, so a controlled temperature, right? For 48 hours, controlled time. And then they count the viable units and they send us off the results, um, like within 72 hours. And to rehash, the municipalities will add stuff to the water to, to keep it safe for drinking um, and prevent any sort of microbial growth. They're gonna add uh, chlorine, they're gonna add ammonia, and that's gonna form chloramines, which is a, a compound 
that is more stable, effective, um, and, and just provides for a better safety mechanism for safe drinking water. Amy standards on free chlorine, less than 0.5 uh, parts per million, and for chloramine or total chlorine, less than 0.1 part per million. And then I won't go over each of these, but what, what I will say is let's rehash that once a year at least, the chemical testing has to be done on the water. And we'll be looking at all of these sort of things. Okay, I do recommend that you read each of the little paragraphs on each chemical just so you kind of know how these contaminants could hurt your patients. Um, but I'll, I'll point out a couple of notable ones on each of these slides, okay? So on this slide, fluoride and nitrates and aluminum, I, I, would, I would definitely, you know, try and lock those in, okay? Um, years ago, nitrates came up on the test in the state, the, the California state test, which was kind of odd to me because um, it's not a very common issue. Um, but nitrates you'll find like in areas where there's like fertilizer and stuff and agricultural areas because nitrogen comes from poop, right? Um, or fertilizers or decom decomposition, stuff like that. Um, so high exposure to nitrates can really um, kind of mess up your, your red blood cells and make it to where they won't carry oxygen. And then fluoride's added to the safe drinking water because, you know, supposedly it's going to help us from our kids from having tooth decay, right? Um, there's a lot of negative, uh, I guess, commentation on, on fluoride use in water. Um, I, I personally don't think it's a necessary element in water, but um, it, it can be dangerous um, even to the general uh, population. But for our patients, fluoride could cause some, some acute illness, some bone problems. Um, and the same with aluminum. Um, you know, aluminum is in the city water. They use it to kind of, as part of the treatment of water to make it pretty, make it clean and clear. Um, but it ends up in, in significant levels in your drinking water. And that's not a problem for me and you because we can get rid of it. But when your kidneys can't get rid of it, and you're starting to build up aluminum in your blood or in other areas of your body, like your brain, <clears throat> make you crazy. can also mess with your bones and mess with your ability to produce red blood cells. <clears throat> And then on the next one, um, you know, these are a little bit more less known elements, but I, I feel like copper <clears throat> and lead are something to pay attention to because they're in our pipes in our house. You know, basically everybody that drinks water from their sinks taking in some copper and lead, and, and that's okay, again, because our kidneys work. But for our patients, that would be really detrimental um, to the point where anything that's in our water system would not be made of copper or lead. It can only ma be made of three types of material. Um, PVC, which is a plastic, stainless steel, or glass. Those three materials, the water will not change them and the water will not be changed by them. So they don't, they don't have the leaching um, characteristic that like copper, if you run water through copper, then w there's gonna be copper in the water and, and uh, the, the copper pipe has lost some of its copper to the water, so it's changing over time. And then this is perhaps one of the more important slides, and, and I think you have the same table in your book, but, um, you know, when you look at what happens to people related to the contaminants in water, it's, it's, it's no light matter. Um, our patients already have many of these health problems on the, 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 the column on the left. So they have anemia, pretty much guaranteed. A lot of our patients have bone disease. Um, hemolysis or rupture of red blood cells is an everyday uh, possibility. Hypertension, high blood pressure, most of our patients have that. And then hypotension, a lot have that or get it during treatment. Uh, pH problems like metabolic acidosis, all our patients have that because they, their kidneys aren't regulating pH anymore. Neurological deterioration nausea, vomiting, and death. So all of these things are not uncommon for dialysis patients. But when you look at the, the water contaminants, like um, it, it shows you like, we don't wanna have additional factors that contribute to all those health problems that m many of them already present, um, but we don't have factors that enhance or, or um, accelerate that process. So like with anemia, uh, aluminum, chloramines, copper, and zinc would complicate things. 
bone disease, aluminum and fluoride. Remember I said it will mess with your bones. Hemolysis from copper, nitrates and chloramine. Hypertension from calcium and sodium and hypotension from bacteria, endotoxin or nitrate. Metabolic acidosis from low pH water or sulfates in the water. Neurological deterioration from aluminum buildup. Nausea, vomiting from uh, bacteria, calcium, copper, endotoxin, low pH, magnesium, nitrate, sulfates, or zinc. And patients can die from pretty much any of the contaminants, but the, the more common uh, um, contaminants associated with death are aluminum, fluoride, endotoxin, bacteria, and chloramine. So really important that we, we do a thorough um, and, and, and even overkill on water treatment. So let's go through the scenario. If you have 10 minutes into the treatment and several patients start to uh, become nauseated around the same time, what will we suspect and what would we do? Several patients, like wh what do they all share? Well, if several of the patients, like everybody was taken care of by the same person, that's a common den denominator. We're gonna look at that person as maybe the problem. Um, but for sure, they're all sharing water. So we're gonna have water as another potential problem. And, and if they be, all became nauseated at one time and we suspected it was water, um, or, or, or better yet, let's just say several nauseated at the same time, first thing we do is notify the nurse. And then collectively it's suspected it's water, what do we do? We will go and we will, um, for the patients that are nauseated, we're, we're gonna treat that, with, and I'll talk about that next, but the first thing we're gonna do is if we think it's water, and if several patients are nauseated, we don't want everybody else getting nauseated and we don't want the next shift coming on and getting nauseated. So we're, we're now in like a, 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 an emergency plan. We've got a water treatment problem. So all the patients gonna come off the machine, right? We're not gonna return their blood, um, especially in the case of those who are nauseated. And I think this will be more of an assessment item from the nurse, but um, typically with any sort of reaction to water, we would not return the blood because returning the blood would just it, like further the problem even more. Um, so if it's, if it's a water treatment problem, protect the patients immediately. So by taking them off, um, we would then investigate the problem, you know, draw water samples, send them off to the lab, see what sort of bacteria or what sort of, um, contaminants we have present. And then in the meantime, everybody's got to get dialysis somewhere else. So we have arrangements that have to be made as part of our emergency preparation for inter-facility, um, agreement. In other words, if my facility has an emergency and I got 200 patients, you know, I might contract with five to 10 other facilities that I can send, you know, a handful of patients on each shift to each of those facilities um, during our time of emergency. And then again, we have all this monitoring, right? We, we do the daily water log. We do the, the every shift chlorine chloramine test. We do one, uh, the beginning and ending of the day, the water hardness test. Uh, we do the at least once a month microbial test. We do the at least once or annually chemical test. All of that is to keep our patients safe. Uh, any sort of failure on our water system, we, we went through that list of, of health issues, right? Health problems. Could be illness, could be death. And we routinely monitor the patient's blood levels at, of different substances. Sometimes those like elevations in the patient's blood levels is related to their diet or the dialysis treatment itself maybe being inadequate. But um, other times, like let's say everybody's having, you know, their aluminum is spiking, like that's a water issue. Unless they're all eating from the same pan or something or taking the same medication. But um what we see in our patient's blood and the trends we see in our in the patient's blood can tell us a lot about water. So let's say I just checked the water like two months ago, did the chemical analysis. And then this month, you know, 10 patients have a, an aluminum that's elevated. Even though I just checked the chemicals two months ago and it's, it's only required once a year, I'm going to go do a chemical test again on the water to see if the water is the cause. All right, guys, so we will um, reconvene on this on uh, Wednesday. 
depending on my schedule, I am in Las Vegas, uh, or I will be in Las Vegas later this evening for a National Association Nephrology uh, Technicians Conference. Depending on the schedule, I may um, do another recording uh, for this that I'll send off to you guys right away uh, so that we can uh, have a second, a second glance at water treatment. Um, I would love if you guys would get into discussion and, and chat about water a little bit so that I can also chime in on that. Uh, sorry about a busy week this uh, this week, but I, I know that you guys will uh, do your part in studying, watch through this video, and then uh, possibly the next one as well. As always, text, email, or call me if you have any issues, and I hope you have a, a great evening. Bye-bye.